vaccine and B6. Correct. So, so that's, yeah, th 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 that was, let me back up a little bit. Um, yep. uh, let me put leucine to the side for just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was thinking about pairings with leucine. And it, a lot of the work I did in the late 1990s and early 2000s had to do with the regulation of lipogenesis, regulation of fat synthesis. Um, and we showed that calcium, meaning a spike in intracellular calcium, mm -hmm. was a, a, an important signal for uh, fatty acid synthase, uh, sterilicoid desaturase, basically for the enzymes involved in making new fat. We know that uh, pyridoxal phosphate, which is the enzymatic form of vitamin B6. It's what you turn your vitamin B6 into after you, after you uh, eat it in a food or supplement or what have you. Uh, we know that that serves, and actually we showed that that serves as a very mild calcium antagonist on the fat cell. It reduced calcium entry into the fat cell. Mm -hmm. uh, but like leucine by itself, it made for some interesting biology but, you know, which means you could write papers about it, but you wouldn't be able to get clinical effects. Um, uh, uh, and by now you can tell I'm more interested in clinical effects than I am mm -hmm. in writing papers. Uh, although we did write the papers. Um, we sort of wondered, well, with this, co what about combining B6 with leucine? If we combined something that might reduce fat synthesis with something that might stimulate fatty acid oxidation, what kind of an effect might we get? So again, we modeled it and modeled it in vitro, and did did a little bit of uh, rodent work, and it looked pretty interesting. So we ran a few clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Clinical trial one was a short term study, a twenty eight day study uh, using respiratory calorimetry, um, and we showed that we could. Uh, it was you know your standard randomized controlled double blind placebo control trial, and we showed that we could uh, increase fatty acid oxidation with this combination, um, and it was a nice increase in fatty acid oxidation on the order of. Uh, 30 some odd grams per day, about 300 calories a day equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, so we said, okay, what is the impact of this on weight? Let's run a couple of more trials. So we ran two more trials. I consider them companion trials and we published them together in one paper. Um, one was in a study in a weight neutral study where people people's diets basically were adjusted to make sure they didn't gain or lose weight over a six month period. And with the leucine B6 combination, what we saw was their weight didn't change because that was the way the study was designed, mm -hmm. but their body fat decreased um, and their lean mass increased. Now I cannot tell you whether it was that it was skeletal muscle mass because we were using DEXA. So, you know, we could define, we could measure lean, we could measure fat. One would presume that it was skeletal muscle, but I cannot promise you that it was. Um, mm. uh, it, that would be the standard presumption. Uh, we then ran the same study um, in combination with mild caloric restriction. And by mild caloric restriction, we mean, I mean the standard diet advice that mm. one gives in an obesity trial not an actually enforced caloric restriction. Um, right. um, and in that study, we got uh, over six months, a placebo adjusted, me com compared to placebo, difference uh, of, uh, of weight loss uh, of 
to an approximation eight to nine kilograms in people that weighed roughly 100 kilograms. So an eight to nine percent weight mm-hmm. loss, which uh, without people trying very hard. Um, and uh, we found that the, that the majority of that weight loss came from the fat compartment. You know, typically when you lose weight, you lose fat and you lose lean. Mm. Uh, And the ratio is somewhere roughly 70% of what you lose is fat and 30% is lean. Some people would say 75, 25, but, you know, it's something on that order. Um, Mm. uh, If you're able to preserve, now, to be fair, people who who are obese have additional lean lean mass. Um, mm. But it would be really handy if we could preserve that lean mass during during weight loss. And it turned out that we substantially, but not completely, preserved it. So we thought, that's interesting. Mm. Um, and uh, sometime shortly thereafter, uh, the question came up of whether it would work in companion animals Hmm. and i thought well that's interesting people are asking me if the human being is a good model for the dog Um, that's not usually the way we think about things but all right i'll be a model for a dog let's try it um so we sponsored a study we didn't run it ourselves uh some of these studies we ran some we sponsored uh we sponsored a, a a a study uh over 12 weeks uh in fat dogs um and uh what we and again placebo controlled trial with a third arm the third arm was a an actual diet caloric caloric Mm -hmm. restricted diet so what you have were a bunch of beagles um uh for all you beagles out beagle owners out there uh you have my sympathy. I know your dogs get fat really easily um, and it's frustrating. Um, and that's why they're used as an animal model for obesity. Um, so they made a bunch of beagles fat and divided them into three groups. One was the placebo group. One was the supplement group. And that was double blind. Um, on standard dog chow, nobody controlled how much they ate. Um it was measured, but not controlled. Um, and the third group was on a special caloric, uh, low calorie canine diet. And what we saw was the supplement group lost the same amount of body weight and same amount of body fat as the group that was on the uh calorically restricted diet, but they didn't have to restrict their calories. Um, uh, They also became more insulin sensitive. uh, And uh, I won't say they reduced their inflammatory stress because we didn't look at it globally, but we certainly certainly saw a decrease in several inflammatory markers. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, the the whole thing of like reducing fat without reducing lean mass, especially as uh, we get older, seems to me like a, a very important thing because you need to protect your lean mass kind of like at all costs, but you don't want to build up any fat at the same time. So that seems like- I agree. Really, yeah. So this is really kind of exciting to us. Hmm. That being said, um, to be perfectly honest, we haven't quite figured out how to bring that to market yet. Uh, right. Mm. In humans. In humans. Only in dogs. Okay. Um, uh, there, there's, yes. So there's, there's been a soft launch in dogs. We have been working with a partner company that has done a soft launch in dogs. It's not, you know, robustly marketed yet in dogs, but it, I believe it will be. So before we leave nutraceuticals, so you were talking about the nutraceutical kind of market before and uh, to kind of, how do you do you see that's changed? Do you see that it's kind of now ready for something like uh, NewSert would would provide? And one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how to make that happen. 
how to right. meet that need? The answer is yes. Um, the way I see it uh, is in parallel with the growth in interest in health span and lifespan. There is now a subset of highly educated and curious consumers that are not interested. They, they may be willing to self-experiment, but being interested in self-experimentation is not the same as buying marketing hype. Um, they actually want to see data. Um, and so I think uh, that group of consumers, I hope, are the tip of the spear, so to speak, uh, meaning uh, that they may not represent the majority of consumers, but I think there's enough of them to begin tilting the balance towards uh, demanding evidence-based uh, supplements mm. uh, yeah yes and I... the challenge there is unless you have something with a lot of intellectual property mm -hmm. you know uh, if you have a supplement that's made up of you know pick your favorite nutrient or botanical um i'm not gonna name i'm not gonna name one but just right. pick one um and you invest in running high quality clinical trials, that just means you're really charitable because there's a whole bunch of competitors who are going to sell that same product and refer to that, that trial or set of trials because hopefully nobody will market based on a single trial. I hope mm -hmm. not. Um, and you could drop several million dollars uh, mm -hmm. And it's it's a nice charitable endeavor. Um, that doesn't work so well for a lot of people. People actually would like to get their money back and maybe make some. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is only going to work for products that are either mm, supported by strong intellectual property mm -hmm. or investigated by governmental or in, and nonprofit foundation kinds of kinds of agencies um i mean it's just the reality yeah. um it's uh... so how close so are you working on kind of squaring that circle and and kind of how close are you to having something on the market i will i don't want to make a public commitment okay what i will say is we're looking very closely at that and we are eager to market uh, what we see as a success mm -hmm. in the nutraceutical space. That being said, we did a hard pivot several years ago mm -hmm. to regulated products and we're putting a strong effort, our strongest effort probably there.